Hi, everybody. Today, we have Figgy Baby with us. Figgy is a music maker, rapper, and performer based in Los Angeles. Their art explores ideas of self-expression, toxic masculinity, and the male social script. But for Figgy, it's important to also talk about these issues off the stage, including one-on-one with their Mexican father. Let's get into it. My name is Figgy Baby. I am an internationally touring rapper, music maker, and dancer based in Los Angeles, originally from Orange County. And growing up, I called my father, papa, dad, and I was feeling really lazy, which he did not like. I'd just be like, ba! <laughs> and I called my mother, mama, mom, shwarma, shmama, little mama. <laughs> Ma, sometimes. There's a certain aspect of distance that my father had emotionally with us. Just there was a lack of intimacy or vulnerability in our relationship because of how a man is supposed to be and how he was raised, right? So let's be strong, stoic. I don't need to say any more than I have to say. And then you just be on your way. Machismo, toxic masculinity, very present. To his credit, I think that he tried to show up the ways that he made sense to him. All my soccer games, he wanted to be there. I became aware of toxic masculinity when I got into college. I had never heard that term before. Male privilege, the inequality. And I was like, oh, well, dang. As a creative, I have to get tapped into my own feelings, right? Very quickly, I was taking all of what I was learning in those kind of more academic, intellectual classes and putting it into my art. I was feeling so much from all of this. I started telling my story, and it was about my relationship with my Latino identity, mixed identity. And a lot of that was exploring the relationship with men in my life, my father, my brother. But to some extent, f- all that language. Like, that's not helpful. Like, patriarchy, like, what the f*** is that? So what I'm just more doing right now that I feel is a value is, like, me just continuing to be, like, I'm going to engage with my father. I'm taking risks and sharing about my life. I wrote a song called Hey Dad, and I talked about growing up feeling like he wasn't as emotionally present as, in retrospect, I would have liked. I wouldn't come to him talking about friendships or relationships because I felt like there was a lot of silence back or like one word answers. I got in a lot of trouble when I was younger. I was just like excited about life. And I think that that means that I'm doing a lot without thinking about it. Eighth grade, I'd already been on probation and kicked out of a school district. And my father didn't speak to me for a week after. And even after that, it was probably sparse. I was writing about those situations and I came home and I showed him the song and felt like, This is me being vulnerable. This is me saying all the things I wanted to say. And it made a crack in the glass. My father was visually emotional. And it took time after that for there to be any true response. But I remember my father calling me past college. I'd released a song called Mr. Barron, which is about getting expelled. And that's the name of the principal who kicked me out of the school. And he called me to apologize to say that, because there's a line that says, you treated me like a criminal, I was a kid. That line wasn't specifically to my father in the song, but was to the system. But my father said, he's like, you were right. We were so hard on you and you were just a kid. He apologized and was starting to get emotional. And I was like, oh shit. Wow, this is radical right now. This is like (laughs) huge, you know, and he called me out of the blue. It wasn't like, let's have a conversation. But I guess that's what happens, right? This interaction I had with my father and these many interactions I had, it's about planting seeds. And a lot of it happens in like, you know, I'm just kind of talking about what I have, right? The kind of like intimacy that I have with my friends, like my homeboys, like even physically, you know, we hold each other. I'll just be like on them or just tell them that I love them. This is what matters. These images, these actions, not always the theory or, you know, not that there's not a place for the vocab because there is. 
But with my father, that's not the way that I'm entering these conversations. I'm really just engaging in vulnerability. And I really give him the opportunity. I'm like, dad, you ain't got to put up a front. If you like feel sad today, like you can be sad. And I'm showing up like me talking about this and talking about, you know, why I wear nail polish or put on skirts sometimes. And I'm just like, I'm so fluid. And I think he's just like a little flustered off of the information and details that I'm sharing with my life. Sometimes he'll engage more. He'll be like, oh, well, I remember one of the first girls I dated that I really loved and whatever. I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm like, don't say anything, Fig. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, more, more, more. But I'm also, you know, I don't want to say anything because then he might remember that he's like talking out loud, you know? Man, these conversations are hard as Hi, everybody. Juleka here. I'm the host and creator of How to Talk to Mommy and Papi About Anything. And I want to invite you to be on our show. If you're an adult and a child of immigrants from anywhere in the world, I'd love to talk to you about those conversations that are hard but necessary. Things about politics, dating, career, parenting. Seriously, no topic is off limits. Send us an email at hello at talktomommypapi.com and let's get you on the show. That's hello at talktomommypapi.com. See you soon. Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Calantigua, the creator and executive producer of How to Talk to High Achievers About Anything. And I'd like to invite you to be a guest on the show. Every episode, we talk to black and brown folks striving to do big things and looking for ways to level up. Licensed psychotherapist Devon Lewis offers feedback about aspirational challenges we all face. Things like imposter syndrome, perfectionism, and especially how we define success. We'd love to hear about your triumphs and where you still trip up sometimes. Send our producer Virginia an email so she can get your story on the show. She's at virginia at lwcstudios.com. Figgy's commitment to being vulnerable with their father while also acknowledging it might be uncomfortable, really moved me. Because as a mom raising two boys, I'm constantly thinking about the men they will become. And Figgy's story made me reflect on the gender norms my sons will contend with throughout their lives. With all the restrictive ideas our society has about what it means to be a, quote, man, what can men, especially first-gen men, do? to deal with the sometimes conflicting ideas? How can they break free from these constraints? And as Figgy points out, are terms like toxic masculinity even useful in these situations? To help us figure it out, I called in an expert. My name is Jerry Teo, and uh, I am recording right now from Los Angeles, and I am the director of the National Compadres Network, also a a father, a grandfather. Uh, my dad is Jorge Perez Teo. He's Tapilan, Coviteca, out of San Antonio, Texas. So we have native roots in us. And my mom, Maria Suso Lager Ramos, from Chihuahua. But I was raised in Compton, Watts, uh, California, and been doing work, you know, in communities for close to 50 years, you know, just trying to bring healing, bring a sense of connection and, uh, you know, peace and good relationships to people in the best way that I can. It sounds a lot like you're doing the work of a tribal elder. That's what it sounds like to me from that beautiful description. When you listened to Figi's story, what did you hear? A lot of love. And I heard the really wish of wanting to uh, be connected, wanting to be acknowledged, but wanting to have a relationship, with, which I believe is at the root of what all of us do. But the other thing that hit me was some of the vocabulary that was used. You know, toxic masculinity, you know, the sense of um, patriarchy and, and machismo and all of that. And it's interesting because society puts these labels, these descriptions that make us put people in boxes and makes us believe that we understand somebody and can really categorize. And for me, what I found in the, the many, many years of this work is those labels, you know, begin to separate us. So what I heard Figgy say and talk about was you know, sense of them being able to show up completely. At the same time, I'm not sure if, if they were able to see their father showing up completely because their father, you know, also has a journey, certain ways that he has learned to be based on his own history. And, and you know, what I learned from my father 
is my father, he carried himself a certain way. He was a very loud talking man, you know, hey, me, Kubeba, get over here, you know, and, and <laughs> didn't understand, you know, I thought, well, my father's angry. No, he wasn't angry. That's the way my father needed to carry himself in order to be able to survive. And for especially for men of color, you know, many times we have to build this shield because as soon as we leave our house, we're looked at in a certain way. And if we don't shield ourselves up, we'll get destroyed. And, and you know, there was a lot of talk about not being able to share feelings. And for many of our fathers who didn't grow up in a time in which we, you know, had the luxury of being able to, to share and sit with each other and go to therapy or, or process things, you get into a mode of survival. And that mode of survival is, you know, if, if you dare to go to your feelings, the bis- biggest fear is, I'm not going to be able to stop crying. It's going to open me up where I'm not going to be able to do what I need to do, which may be work and take care of my family. So I hear you saying a couple of things. I hear you saying, be wary of labels Mm -hmm. because they are basically incomplete and they can sometimes lead you incorrectly to believe that you know someone because you or someone else has labeled them X, Y, and Z. Right. Okay. The other thing that I hear you saying, though, is take time to see. Yeah. Let's dig a little bit here. A lot of our immigrant parents are survivalists. Yes. A lot of them are just in survival mode. And we literally often don't see them as much. We also see them in in very limited roles as caretaker, provider, mom, dad. How can someone like Figgy take the time to really be able to see their parents in a fuller capacity? Well, I think one is the consciousness and the acknowledgement of one's journey. You know, many of us don't know our parents. We don't know their journey. And and a lot of them don't want to share it because it's so painful. But if we have a consciousness, we know historically, you know, what many immigrant parents have gone through, what many, you know, people of color's parents have gone through, what they go through every day. At the same time, we, um, a society, as a young kid, for instance, you know, I learned that good dads read to you and play with you and take you to the park and, <laughs> and do all these fun things with you. And I remember my father, when I woke up in the morning, he was at work. He would come in the middle of the day, change, get his lunch, go back to another job. So by the time I went to sleep, my dad a lot of times wasn't home. So in, in my eyes, the teacher was saying, good dads play with you. They take you to the park. They, I'm, I'm, and I'm thinking, my dad's not a good dad. So then you begin to put these stereotypical labels And that begins to then filter into your perception of, do you have a good father? Do you have somebody that wants a relationship with you, right? And sometimes it just takes the time just to be with somebody, just to begin to open up and see them according to their lens. And that begins then an exchange of being able to be with each other, to see each other. And that's the first step. So one of the the things that I really enjoyed about Fee's story was that they talked about telling themselves to be quiet when their dad was sharing a story. And I love that because that's that acknowledgement of, okay, something really cool and amazing is happening right now. I just have to be still so that I can be present for it. Yeah. I mean, and I think we hear a lot, but sometimes we don't listen And many times, you know, we find ourselves only taking in what is comfortable for us. I want to come back to that concept of machismo, because we often think somebody being bold or loud or, you know, bien brusco, whatever that is, we tend to put that into a label. And sometimes that's survival mechanism. But the true sense of machismo is that of being honorable, of being respectful, taking care of those that you're responsible for, honoring women. Honoring children. There's really, from our indigenous sense, there's some really powerful principles. So, there's another very popular word that I want to talk about, which is vulnerability. Figgy very clearly says, I have to practice vulnerability. Mm. This is not just an academic term, this is actually a verb to be practiced. And it seems incompatible for many men that this definition of being a man also now requires you to be vulnerable. What's the conflict there, or how do we bridge that? We have to really understand that, that in the essence of who we are, in, in my indigenous native part of me, you know, in, in my native Mexicano part of me, the true sense of being a complete hombre noble, if you will, the noble man, includes 
being able to live in your masculine, being able to live in your feminine, being able to live in your child space, being able to live in your elder space as well. The true sense of balance is being able to shift when you need to. As a dad, you know, an earthquake happens and my kids, dad, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking inside, but I'm saying everything's okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's all right. Everything's fine, you know. But there has to be times also that you are sensitive, are compassionate. The problem is that in the developmental process, you know, I mean, little boys are cute. Black and brown boys are cute until they get a certain age, until they get a voice. And all of a sudden now, at eight, I'm having to watch my back. When I walk in the store, people are, I mean, there's already a shield. Yep. Yeah, they're already following me. And, and it's like, dude, how do I survive this, you know? If we don't have healthy men as examples, as teachers, rites of passage, we do what we see. And if all we see is men that are surviving, men that are wounded, then that's the way we're going to be. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about how our natural, you know, family orientedness can help in this healing. What is the role for wives, daughters, sons, and other people when someone is themselves going through a healing journey? Well, I, I think that the sense of acknowledgement and support, we get used to people being a certain way. Going back to my father, when he would get emotional, he missed his mom or somebody had passed. You know, my mom would get very uncomfortable with that. And, you know, suck it up. Let's go. Come on. We got stuff to do. And, and, and see, that's the interesting thing because my mom wasn't very affectionate. She wasn't very expressive emotionally, but we don't see that as toxic. We said, well, my mom's going through some stuff. Right. But when men go through that, it's kind of, yeah, bien macho, you know what I mean? And we begin to blame. And so part of this is us, first of all, understanding the sense of growth and development is within all of us, and we need to support each other. The younger we can, uh, you know, show the example for our young children that it's okay to express the different elements of who you are, and if you're emotional, that's okay, and, and if not, you're okay too. And then show the example of that too, I think that's important. Yeah, um, I'm raising two boys, <laughs> mm. and I am always intentional when they ask me, Mama, are you okay? To be honest, as appropriate, right? So I will say, actually, I'm a little bit stressed. Something's going on at work today. Can I have a hug? Mm -hmm. Or I've got a problem that I haven't figured out how to solve. And then I try to say, you know, something positive. Like, but I'm, I'm sure I'm going to work through it. I'm sure I'm going to figure it out. Because I don't want them to worry, right? Because that's the other thing. I think in many of these relationships, especially the parent-to-child relationship, we take on roles like you did to protect your kids. But what's the line between protecting and sheltering to the point where they really can't see you for who you are? Yeah, and I, and I think the other part is that because I've worked with families in which yeah, there's little boys that are bien chino, chiones, they're crying all the time. And it's like the mother's raising boys and don't want the boy to be if you will, harsh and all of that. So they really baby this. this, And, and he becomes spoiled and thinks that he deserves everything and right. should be- Entitled. You know, there's a sense of entitlement. And so what we really need to really focus on is balance. Being able to be in your emotional side, but being able to be in your logical side sometimes, your reasoning side, being able to go where you need to go you know, when it's necessary. And that's the thing that our society doesn't teach us. And so we- need to teach each other that and to see each other, you know, the examples, the tios, the, the fathers, the grandfathers. And I think um, what Figgy expresses in their music is important too, because we need to see it in music. We need to see it in art and movies and all that. We need to see those examples so that it becomes also a narrative that we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. That's actually a perfect place to end because it is about being able to support one another in being all of the ways in which it is appropriate for us to be. Jerry, thank you so much for coming on the show. Please come back. Yeah, well, thank you for all that you do and having these conversations. All right, here's what Jerry taught us today. Avoid labels. Labels are deceiving. They make it easier to assume things we don't know. They reinforce stereotypes and they hinder our ability to see people, including our loved ones, for who they really are. Aim for balance. 
Everyone is capable of being emotional and being logical. It's not about policing which behaviors or emotions are allowed. It's about understanding when and how to tap into each part of ourselves. And remember, acknowledge their journey. People are who they are in part because of their lived experiences. Learning about what your relatives have gone through will help you know them more fully and on a deeper level. Thank you for listening and for sharing us. How to Talk to Mommy and Papi About Anything is an original production of LWC Studios. Virginia Lora is the show's producer. Trent Lightburn makes this episode. I'm the creator, Julie Calantigua. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at Talk to Mommy Papi. Bye, everybody. Talk to you soon. <laughs>